Well, our next discussion is incredibly important, especially now, and it is why correlation is unreliable in finance. I'd like to bring out our moderator, Dimitris Velatsas, the chief economist of Green Mantle, who will be hosting this conversation with Nassim Nicholas Taleb, the distinguished scientific advisor from Universa Investments. I'll let you two take it away. Thank you for inviting us. Thanks so much. After you, you take this one. Go left. Hello, everyone. And uh, hi, Nassim. Um, I have the distinct um, honor of uh, interviewing uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Your brief bio, um, he spent over 20 years as a derivatives trader before becoming a researcher in the philosophy of mathematics of uh, probability. Um, Nassim is the author of multiple books that have had a profound income on how investors think about the world. Um, a few that you may know, The Black Swan, Fooled by Randomness, Anti-Fragile, Skin in the Game, covering broad facets of uncertainty and some of the topics we'll be talking about today. Um, Taleb is a distinguished professor of risk engineering at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering and a distinguished scientific advisor for Universal Investments. Um, his current research focuses on the properties of system that can handle disorder, um, i.e. our anti-fragile. Uh, Hopefully. Welcome. Awesome. Um, so you chose the title for this discussion, so I think I'm going to jump straight into it. Okay, let, let, so let, let, I know we're going to talk about wars and pandemics, so I was trying <laughs> to focus on something other than that, but we're going to end up talking about wars and pandemics. I picked the title because about 20 years ago, I gave a talk at the Greenwich uh, thing explaining that correlation doesn't work and the risk metrics we use, like standard deviation, all that doesn't work in finance because we live in a fat-tailed world. And uh, it, you requ it requires a lot of gullibility to believe in these methods, like sharp ratio. Sharp ratio turned out uh, soon later to be the best indicator of a bankruptcy. A high sharp ratio is the best indicator of the bankruptcy of a fund, uh, incidentally. So not only these metrics are, don't work, but if they work, they work backwards. And allocation based on portfolio theory doesn't work. And I showed uh, in a recent paper uh, that basically mathematically it doesn't work, but also empirically you need to be a real, 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 real uh, sucker to believe in them. So that's sort of like, so we, we got this out of the way. We made the point. And the reason is fat tails. So which brings to your domain, which is history. Exactly. So. so um, you know, you mean that when we see things that really scare us, things like pandemics, uh, things like wars, um, we shouldn't rush to treasuries? Uh, okay. That seems to have been the, um, the, the, the... Okay, we don't know what to rush for. Uh, in the past, people would rush to gold. But the whole idea of building a portfolio based on correlation also assumes knowing whether or not you're going to have a crisis and also what will happen during the crisis. So we're talking about multi-levels of, of thinking. But to talk, talking about uh, uh, pandemics and wars, um, it's sort of actually closer to my own work. Uh, you know, as I say, to try to pull away from finance and break, bring you back into it. Uh, because I have been researching, given that I do fat tails work, pandemics and wars. So. Uh, and, 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 and it sort of happened that the past couple of years we had an interesting dose of both, you know? Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about war. Yeah, I mean, war. This is something that's on everyone's mind, obviously, what's happening in Europe. Um, you spend most of your life studying the unexpected. Um, yes, was this exactly. War unexpected? Yes. So, so let me tell you what, what the properties of war. We got into a debate with... Uh, with Steven Pinker, and for those who are in finance to see exact parallel, and uh, when I finished The Black Swan, which says that history is dominated by rare events that carry very large consequences, uh, there was a, a theory by a fellow called Ben Bernanke, for those of you who still remember uh, or you know who he was. Okay, and Ben Bernanke had written about something called the Great Moderation saying, now we have, you know, and the ink was not dry on the black swan. You know, you've got the book, you can still smell the ink. When that uh, crisis 2007 happened, 
And coincidentally, we started Universal, okay, which was uh, right in the nick of time to capture that big tail event of 2007, 2008. So that was, and it was basically a, 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 a nice uh, uh, argument against the great moderation because the great moderation had been discussed, like we control and, and everything, and, and because of rationality, we know how to work with markets, and the world is a safer place financially. In parallel, started the fight with a fellow called Steven Pinker, who is, uh, I call him a pseudo-scholar, but you can call him whatever you want. Steven Pinker uh, at Harvard, a psychologist who writes books, who has a theory very similar to the Great Moderation about the long peace. <laughs> okay. Very, very similar in every single respect. And uh, ended up publishing uh, articles showing the fattest tales of all tales is pandemics. The second fattest tale of all tales is wars. So and things are getting does, better. Yes, sorry? Things are getting better. We're done with the pandemic. We're, we're moving on to war. Exactly. So, <laughs> so, and to give you an idea of what we mean by that, uh, the, by fat tales, it means few events determine most of the properties. If you take people killed in history, few number of episodes killed them. And the other property of fat tales, whether in finance, is that there is a long inter-arrival time between them. There's a long period of, uh, so for example, if you take in history, you can't say, oh, the world is a better place because we haven't had a big war, a world war in how many years? 60 years, 70 years, 45 minus 2022 is, oh, it's getting long. You know what? Okay, 70 some years. The average inter-arrival time between large wars is more than 100 years. So, in a, you know, just like average arrival times and finance uh, between crises is about 10 years, maybe. So for war, it's longer, but more brutal. So, so and in 1980s, there was another uh, Steven Pinker. People don't talk about failed scholars with a theory of a great peace because we had nothing in Europe between the last Napoleonic War, say, after the Congress of Vienna, so from 1815. Uh, 15, all right, uh, 1812, 1815, okay, so from 1812, we, 1813, we had no war until, no big war until a few skirmishes, Crimean War, and the first war, so we had about a century with nothing, you see. So, so Nassim, um, clearly that period of great peace has also ended for Europe. Um, there's, there's a war going on right now. Yes. And when we're discussing this, you said that Wars, you can, you can very easily tell when they start, but you can't really tell where they end. That's exactly. Ex ante. So what will be the intended or unintended consequences of this war for, kind of for humanity, for world order? Exactly. For so, equities markets? Yeah, so this is interesting because, and I go back to, I, I found one paper by your colleague, uh, Neil Ferguson, remind him of that, where a lot of people may have predicted the First World War but the market, as expressed in the price of war bonds, at which he looked at, did not predict its duration. You, see, you say, oh, war, but what is a war? You know, tail event could, could kill uh, X number of people, say 5,000 people, and it's over, and then they have champagne, and they become friends. Or, as what happened in 1930. Uh, uh, so you realize the duration of conflicts um, the uh, Israeli-Arab uh, conflict is what started in the uh, 40s, so say intensified 46, 48 is the first uh, big event. At no point in time, I know Palestinian refugees who came to Lebanon, okay, with temp and temporary housing, temporary housing in 1948, all right? So, uh, you realize what, what uh, that, that people underestimate the duration of war. The Lebanese Civil War lasted 17 years. It may restart, okay? So you, you realize that these events, you know when they start, and during these events, people always have the illusion that things are gonna get better tomorrow. It's just a mental bias we have. And if you look at accounts of what happened uh, in this first war, the first war people thought would be over in no time. Okay. So, you mentioned the, the great moderation. One of the intellectual tenets behind it was that 
we've somehow policymakers have learned from the mistakes of the past, and now there is endogeneity in monetary policy. We've implemented it. We know how to deal with it. Um, and I don't want to talk too much about monetary policy, but they seem to have lost the ball as well. Yes. Um, is it? In your studies, have you seen this endogeneity? Do people learn from uncertainty? I haven't get seen better at it. I haven't seen anything in history that says that people are better at handling uncertainty. Except and this is why I wrote Skin in the Game by saying the way systems learn is how via evolution. How does evolution happen? Not by convincing people, but by replacing them with better people. Okay. That's how evolution works. Companies don't get better, they go bankrupt, and the replacement is gonna be better. Restaurant food doesn't get better on its own. The Soviet tried that, okay, so th this one element to consider. The second one about monetary policy. We had the illusion that monetary policy can solve a structural problem. In fact, it makes it worse. They learned to lower rates, okay? Why? Greenspan at some point in time started pushing it. It did work. It saves your job because it may work for a few weeks or years. But what's the side effect of lowering rates? It's pretty much a hedge fund industry. Rich people having a lot of money. It creates social, it creates social inequality. It increases the value of all assets that, that, that have, you know, uh, uh, any story to them, basically. Uh, and it creates something like Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, Bitcoin is thought to be a hedge against inflation. It's mostly a, a hedge, uh, <laughs> a reverse hedge, because it's created by low interest rates. So lowering interest rates, in fact, has created a lot of distortions. And, and we're not even sure whether it really works in an economic environment, because you know, the people overestimate the, the notion of lending. So, uh, so we have suffered from 10 years now of low interest, more than 10 years of low interest rates, very low interest rates, and there's no evidence that 4% is not better than 0%, okay? We have no evidence. In history, interest rates, low percent, you know, 4% when, when you had mild inflation, seem to work well. And now they lost the tool of monetary policy. And, and what happened during uh, uh, COVID, uh, plus there's another thing, is that the structure of the financial world, the disintermediation, is such that we're not even sure that the government create, whether the government creates money. So, so what they can control now is interest rates, and we're not even sure it works. So, but what we know, from these policies is that we have had something like 150 trillion, somewhere between 100 and 200 trillion of valuation inflation over the past 10 years in real estate. I mean, we're in Miami, check on real estate, all right? Compare it to 2008 or even to 2006. So what you had is 150 trillion worldwide of valuation in things. <laughs> directly coming from mm -hmm. the, the fact that it costs nothing to invest. Right, so we've, um, you know, you've laid out um, the issue with fat tails. I think a lot of investors um, have, have read your books and are thinking about this actively. Um, what's the best way to hedge against well, I mean, fat tails? When visibly, it comes to I'm, 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 you have here the name of our firm, Universal. <laughs> I saw the name coming. Yeah, yes, yeah, here. Okay, so the the so, but I'm not gonna, as they say. Uh, uh, so sing, other than investing with you, yeah, um, what, uh, what, what ways are there? To, uh, the the <laughs> first thing tails. you gotta realize that under fat tails, the tools you have don't work. That, that it is important, and then when you realize that tools don't work, you should invest into something that does not depend on those tools. A very simple logical consequence. Okay, you should also realize that you may face an environment in which what has been working in the past will no longer work. So you need hard hedges, not soft hedges. And I recommend people who can't hedge their tail to just not invest. <laughs> it is simple. You say, well, what are we gonna do with my money? I say, sometimes under the mattress is better than... Uh, than... And, and, and finally, there's, people have the fear of inflation 
there are two inflations. There's goods and services, okay, and buying your uh, morning coffee at Starbucks, uh, or sorry, buying your bad morning coffee at Starbucks. I had a bad experience today, okay. And then there's the other thing is the assets, okay. Mm -hmm. The second, uh, second category has been ignored. Uh, the best hedge, I think, that you may have, if you are not equipped, you know, to do tail hedges, is in being in cash when there's fear of inflation because assets are the ones to go first. See, so, right. simple, no? So, and, and um, clear. Especially in a, in a situation where, um, you know, geopolitical events can exacerbate inflation as well. I'm sure a lot of people have this fear. But I wanted to ask you, you know, very early on in the pandemic, um, you said this would be an order of magnitude worse than, than people understood at the time. And yes, we, we, we started, uh, okay, so as part of my, my uh, militantism against uh, the system, I was fighting for, uh, against, uh, again, same Steven Pinker among them, okay, people who thought that it's irrational to worry about uh, Ebola that killed two Americans or three Americans, and more people, and then they came up with this argument when, when COVID started that more people have died in their swimming pool than from COVID. Well, you can't compare something that is fat-tailed, like pandemics, or multiplicative, to something that is Gaussian, like number of people who drown in a swimming pool, okay? And uh, the variation, I mean, something can be multiplied by, 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 by several order of magnitude. So had, before, we were already prepared, a group of friends and I, uh, for the pandemic, intellectually, by showing that these tools, this is multiplicative, and, and all you guys uh, don't think in, in terms of multiplicative terms. Like, for example, if, if, if you drown in your swimming pool, odds are your neighbor, uh, you know, unless you have a very imitative uh, neighbor, odds are will not drown in her or his swimming pool. But if a person gets uh, COVID, odds are her or his neighbor is going to get COVID. <laughs> okay. So, uh, it's simple, my grand uncle and grandmother knew that, but I, 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 the, the analytical tools are not adapted to it, so we were mm -hmm. fighting for it. Same as in finance, people using Gaussian distribution and value at risk for things to, uh, that are fat-tailed. So we started with this and started you know, making people aware of the methods used to contain pandemics, namely isolation of groups like to isolate continent, you're safe. So lock out, not lock down. That was our fight first. Right. And, and stuff like that. So, so we did, in, in, in the beginning, the establishment was against the idea of fighting the pandemic. And then the establishment flipped. So, but, so we were you know, fighting the establishment initially, and then later on uh, helping the establishment against disinformation. So um, I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you, we've had the pandemic, we've had the war, what's next? I don't know, but the pandemic is not a black swan because in a black swan, it discuss pandemics as the highest risk it can face us, right? Nor is a war, of course, a black swan. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, what's next, what white swans are next? I think a big contraction of, of, uh, of, uh, of, assets, uh, you know, that have, have been inflated the past 10 years is probably something that we'll witness. Because central banks now started fighting, you know, inflation. And when you start, you develop an appetite for higher rates. And they'd rather be blamed for creating, in the past, they'd rather be blamed for creating inflation than creating unemployment. But now it's going to be the reverse. All right, so uh, thanks erosion, very much, yes. Nassim, uh, for explaining all this for us and giving us something to worry about. Uh, I think we're now uh, <laughs> okay. out of time. Thank you very much. Great, thank you.